Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Hardly welcome to our next edition of Diplomacy, Your Questions, Our Answers. Today, our expert is Patrick Müller. He is professor of European Studies at the, Diplomatic, at the Vienna School of International Studies. And I, uh, he will talk in two blocks between them and after them, you have the possibility to ask your questions. And uh, please uh, raise the, uh, use the raise the hand function and we will then give you the floor in turn. So Patrick, it's your floor, please. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Bujak, for, for this kind introduction and welcome to all of you here at the Diplomatic Academy in, in our Zoom lecture. So this is uh, a format that's also in a way new to us. Usually we invite you, of course, to come in person to the Diplomatic Academy, but given the current uh, situation, which of course is also related to the topic of today, um, we, we stick with this new format, um, the Zoom lecture. Um, I think that um, uh, one of the probably very few um, positive aspects of uh, the Corona a virus uh, crisis is that you don't have to explain so much about it as we are all feeling it in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, we all have been concerned with health issues, with the health of our family, um, with the health of colleagues and uh, friends, and of course, um, uh, especially with, with health issues related to those uh, in, in our populations that are at, at greater risks. Um, but in the, in the shadow of, of all this and in the shadow of all the reporting also on the economic consequences of the corona crisis and uh, the social consequences, uh, in the shadow of all this, you uh, can see another a challenge looming. Uh, and that is really um, a challenge that relates more to politics and how the European Union is governed. Um, and uh, uh, recently you could read um, newspaper headlines like um, that Hungary has uh, developed into uh, Europe's first um, corona um, autocracy uh, and that Poland looks like it's on track to become the second. Uh, adults use um, words uh, in the media uh, like uh, dictatorships. So um, you can see that, um, of course, uh, populist movements and parties in Europe have always had a kind of uh, a reputation of, for, for democratic backsliding and for contesting liberal values, that uh, in this kind of uh, emergency um, situation and a little bit under the radar maybe of of, of a lot of um, what's reported in the media, uh, other shifts have taken place uh, in Europe that, uh, as mentioned, relate more to how Europe is governed and to uh, the politics of the European Union. Uh, and what I would like to do here um, with you today really is to, to look what does it mean for um, European foreign policy, um, because this is really what what I study a lot uh, in my own work. And of course, I look uh, forward to all of your questions and to um, uh, engage in a discussion after um, this short um, uh, introductory um, presentation. So when we talk about challenges to um, European foreign policy, let's uh, talk a few um, fundamentals um, of what European foreign policy um, is really about. So when you look at uh, Europe's foreign policy, as a system uh, of uh, governance, um, you see it's, it's quite complex. Now it has uh, various layers, now it has the EU institutions and, and transgovernmental cooperation at the European level. And then of course there is the, the, the level of the member states, which uh, especially in diplomacy and, and, and security, they're very much uh, in charge of, of, of European foreign policy. So it has multiple actors, it has various levels, it's complex and it's diverse. Um, the diversity you see already when you look at the now 27 member states. Um, these member states have very different uh, histories, they have different relations, bilateral relations, priorities, um, identities if you want, and of course um, geographically they're located uh, in different parts of Europe. Uh, if you look at Spain, now it has uh, in the south-west uh, uh, borders the Mediterranean and, and Morocco, and uh, if you go to Finland, now to the, to the northeast, you have a border to, to Russia, so also geopolitics differs in Europe. 
And, and always for European foreign policy, this has kind of raised the question, what is really the glue? Now, what is really um, the foundation that holds Europe together as a collective actor? And I think to understand the impact of populism and then also the current um, corona um, situation, uh, you should look at this glue, what holds uh, Europe uh, together. And I think um, if you do so, you can identify a few uh, fundamental components. Um, so uh, let me go uh, through this component. So the first component really would be that Europe um, imagines uh, itself as a successful project of regional integration. Uh, you might remember uh, Europe was awarded uh, the Nobel uh, Peace Prize for uh, bringing peace through integration uh, to Europe and also for kind of setting an example for the world. And, and this really is what you know, European foreign policy to a considerable extent um, is about, that you feel that um, integration in Europe was successful in terms of um, bringing peace to the continent, also in terms of through the common market to, to, to create a prosperous uh, and uh, seizable um, economy that is uh, really uh, competitive on um, a global scale. Um, and all this um, is important also for how um, Europe imagines its role in the world. So uh, Europe is really believing it's worthwhile to invest uh, in governance um, at the global scale through multilateral institutions to solve conflict, not by force and coercion, but to rely on, on law and, um, and uh, skillful uh, diplomacy. Um, so, so it's really, um, there's the strong link between internal integration and how Europe imagines um, its role in the world. And, and this is kind of a commonly shared idea, at least uh, over the last years uh, it was. Um, and then of course, um, there is a, a second important component and that, that is that Europe um, feels it's um, committed to certain um, foundational norms. So what are these norms? Uh, it's democracy, it's human rights, also the respect, of course, uh, for uh, minorities, um, it's um, a democracy. Now, all these kind of core uh, values that you find when you look uh, through the Treaty on the European Union um, in, in Article 2, these, these kind of core values. And Europe believes that, you know, this is also something that it commonly shares when it conducts its international relations. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, Europe will always live up to these values, um, but as we all, all know, we uh, occasionally um, we, we uh, run over uh, red uh, traffic lights, but this doesn't mean that we don't respect traffic rules in general or that we are uh, having a quite anarchistic uh, nature. Um, a third component um, is that Europe has developed a certain culture of cooperation. Just imagine, I think we are now uh, about 18 uh, participants here. And um, if I would ask you, please decide on where you want to go to your next vacation together, it will be very difficult to reach a compromise. And, and Europe, it's 27 member states and, and it has to take very difficult uh, decisions. Um, and, and, and here it has really developed um, a culture that it values compromise, it values to um, take into consideration uh, important um, needs of, of other member states. Um, and, 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 and this kind of commitment is very important to get things done. If all the member states in Europe just um, insist on, on narrow interests and define their interests in very narrow terms, that really uh, limits its ability to, to be coherent, to speak with one voice and to act on a global scale. So this is really an important uh, component. And then you have a, a fourth component and, and this component really um, is performance. So uh, Europe uh, um, always fears you know, that um, uh, integration, a common market um, and, and the European project is something that, that works, that delivers in economic terms, that delivers also in, in political terms. And if Europe uh, loses this trust or if Europe uh, fails to perform, um, then this also will uh, affect its, its international um, standing and uh, essentially its foreign relations. So, so these are really um, four key components. And, and before opening up for questions, 
Uh, let me also briefly say, well, how does this now relate to, to populism? And later after the question, we can tackle you know, the corona issue uh, a bit in, in more depth. So I think populism uh, has, you know, brings um, to EU foreign policy uh, a couple of, of challenges. And um, the first uh, uh, challenge, um, maybe let me expand a bit what, what populism then, then means. Now, um, uh, populism is on the one hand, you know, it's on the rise. And, and um, if you want to define it, there's some confusion, of course, what it is. But if you want to define it, a key distinction is really this fundamental opposition between um, the people on the one hand and the elite. And, and this distinction is really made in, in moral terms. So uh, morally, the, the, the people are virtuous, they are you know, the good, the common people, um, and, and the elite is, you know, is, is corrupt. And, um, and this is really a, a strong uh, moral statement and, and distinction. And then this, this movement usually dock on uh, to other ideologies. Um, Right-wing populism, which which I think is the main concern uh, in Europe, uh, docks on to some forms of of nationalism, uh, and here the people is frequently equated um, with the nation, um, and and that of course you know raises certain uh, tensions with you know how Europe imagines uh, its role uh, and its external relations. Uh, on the one hand, uh, populist uh, movement, right-wing populist movements frequently in their discourse uh, and also through actions um, portray the nation state as something that's more legitimate um, than uh, the integration project. So uh, populists emphasize you now the, the general will of the people and that this general will uh, should also find expression in foreign policy and they contrast this in the discourse to something that you might want to describe uh, as a um, liberal utopia. So in, in this view, it's really the nation state that is the legitimate form of governance. Uh, it's a very classical, if you want, understanding of international relations as relations among uh, nation states. And here, international institutions, supranational governance, uh, the EU and Brussels um, bureaucracy, they are really part of a elite, of a supranational um, elite that um, uh, does not really serve um, the will of the people. So you have this kind of tensions between um, the, the people and the nation uh, on the one hand um, and uh, the elite and the supranational elite on the other hand. And, and the second really point of friction is that populists also really take strong issues um, with the liberal values that form uh, the core of the European uh, identity. So populists are not against democracy. Um, they value um, popular sovereignty. They value um, authoritarian decision-making, but they are very skeptical um, about all these um, liberal constraints on, um, on, on governance. So um, they are against um, being constrained by, by judges. If you remember this, this famous line by, by uh, US President Trump, the so supposed uh, judges, they are skeptical about media um, as a constraint, uh, civil society, you name it. So it's really this liberal constraint on the popular will um, that uh, they uh, take issue with. And this, of course, undermines um, core fundamental values that Europe stands for in its foreign policy and that should provide unity and coherence and, and a sense really of who you are, uh, so a sense of identity. Uh, a third uh, point of friction uh, is that uh, populism takes a quite negative approach to compromise. So whilst uh, uh, the EU is very much about solidarity and cooperation and uh, a culture of trust, if it wants to be successful, um, populism thinks that uh, engaging in policy compromise um, with elites, uh, with the Brussels technocracy, um, this is something morally problematic because it's a corrupting process where you don't uh, live up to the expectations and the will of the people, but you make EU level compromise. So, so here again, th there is tension and there is a challenge. And, and, and force um, uh, is uh, concerning you know, the, the EU's ability to deliver. And here you really also see that populists often tend to criticize the EU 
on its performance level. So the nation state is the one that protects the people, the nation state is the one that protects uh, borders and, and, and uh, integration is something that, that is um, problematic also not only in terms of um, legitimacy but also in terms of performance. So you have all these tensions and um, as I will uh, uh, talk later, these tensions get kind of amplified by the current corona crisis, but they have been there for, for some time. You can look at the corona crisis, you know, pretty much as a, as a health crisis. Now we need to find ways now to, to it's in this phase of opening up uh, in a responsible way. Uh, you know, we need to think how to get the children back to school. We have to think about all this now. And, and in the next phase, you know, you, you need to think, you know, how to restart the economy and but uh, Europe also can play at this level. Um, and also, of course, how to uh, allow for some kind of normal social relations. Um, you, you can look at all this, but uh, of course, you can also, you know, uh, focus and I think you should on um, this governance crisis that is looming behind it. And, um, and you can see um, some quite, uh, I think, uh, alarming to some extent uh, things happening in the kind of shadow of the this larger uh, pandemic and, and health crisis. And, and the first you know, observation is that democratic backsliding has really um, intensified um, during the corona crisis. So if you look at Hungary, if you look at Poland, um, in this uh, emergency situation, governments have, have grabbed more power. And of course, um, any country in Europe at the moment has scaled back uh, on you know, certain freedoms that we enjoy, certain rights that we uh, enjoy, be it, you know, just the right to, to go where we want to go, the freedom of movement, uh, borders uh, are closed uh, to, to, to a considerable extent, uh, air traffic is down uh, to, a, to a very large extent. So um, all this has becoming the kind of new normal, now to some extent, uh, even so if it still doesn't feel very normal uh, to most of us. But um, these uh, processes that happened in, in some member states, they have gone uh, really, really far. So in, in Hungary, uh, a new law, for instance, uh, has been passed uh, that allows uh, um, Prime Minister uh, Viktor Orban to govern uh, by decree, and uh, that is for an indefinite uh, period of time. Uh, it also um, uh, greatly reduces abilities for oversight, um, etc uh, for freedom of expression so so ser very serious things have happened you know in terms of scaling down um, these rights and that also sends a strong signal uh, when you think that foreign policy and europe internationally stands for these uh, very values um, the second um, you know thing that's happening apart from you know this democratic backsliding really um, is that um, europe at the um, eu level found it extremely difficult to um, respond to these um, uh, developments, uh, not only to the development, um, you know, that we just talked about this democratic backsliding. Uh, Europe has uh, issued, you know, a declaration that uh, 13 member states have uh, supported um, that uh, uh, expressed uh, strong concerns. That's not a strong signal um, if you think Europe has 27 member states, but Europe also found it difficult, you know, to um, at least, you know, uh, manage public uh, expectations about other parts of its reform. Uh, member states nearly, uh, nearly, uh, nearly um, have uh, taken, you know, the, the biggest um, responsibility um, and load to um, respond to the economic uh, and health crisis um, initially. Um, health, of course, is, you know, an issue that's really a competence at the EU level. So Europe uh, per definition, per uh, uh, distribution of authority, uh, can only do so much. But uh, in the economy, it has taken quite some time you know, to work out compromise, and compromise still is in the making and, 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 and of course, uh, imperfect. Um, you might remember all these um, discussions about uh, so-called uh, corona bonds. Now, the corona bonds um, have been heavily um, in the media, um, they have not uh, then materialized and they have often been presented by individual member states really as, as a test of European solidarity, of a test of the European project, uh, also in order to create quite a lot of um, public pressure on Europe, on EU institutions, on other member states to, to move on joint solutions on this. But of course this um, 
also um, has a big impact on public perceptions of the European Union. And even so, quite a few things have happened, quite a few measures also in the economic realm have now been taken at the EU level, including this um, recovery fund. Um, this still, you know, in the, in the media discourse um, often um, kind of takes the back seat um, and, and, and you really see that, you know, in, in a really emergency situation and crisis, it's member states uh, who act and it's Europe who, um, who has problems to, to find compromise. Um, and, and that also, you know, to some extent um, has to do with how member states go about it. And, you know, sometimes you feel that member states criticizing uh, EU level performance forget that they are part of this um, project um, themselves and uh, share the responsibility for um, suboptimal um, policy outcomes. And, and kind of a final um, observation relating, uh, related uh, to all this really is that, um, that the EU's performance um, in this um, corona crisis is not exclusively judged, of course, you know, against the backdrop what is happening in Europe, but also how do other international actors perform. So uh, Europe is very hardly hit by the corona crisis. And of course, at the moment, any country and, and, you know, and any um, institution, they look for, you know, lessons learned and they compare statistics. If you go to Google, you know, you find this world maps that compare numbers, even so they are measured quite different and, you know, the testing capacities are quite different of all these countries. But, you know, everybody tries to make this comparison. And in and, and all this, um, Europe, of course, you know, from the numbers, it doesn't look very good. There are other examples that seem, you know, to have acted earlier. Not all of them are very democratic. And at the same time, you have, you know, external actors like China um, that, you know, start delivering um, masks and medical supplies to uh, member states of the European Union that have hit, been hit particularly hard by the corona crisis and they crea creating this sense of, you know, um, external um, solidarity in a situation where member states kind of fight for themselves. So I think that's another, you know, thing um, to really observe, you know, that, that Europe uh, is measured and its performance against um, the performance of other actors. And some of these actors, and I think it's fair to uh, again mention China here, they push quite aggressively um, their own narrative on crisis management also uh, into the sphere of EU public um, perceptions. And, and, you know, that can really undermine undermine uh, also Europe's own confidence and trust that you know, it's really the successful project of integration, that, um, uh, that integration is really um, the level, you know, EU, uh, or, or the EU level is really you know, a strong value added in this kind of crisis. And it can, of course, strengthen you know, uh, external actors uh, also uh, in terms of their own narratives uh, and performance, but also in, in undermining uh, EU performance. So, so maybe let me conclude here with the second block. Um, and I hope it, it sparks, you know, some kind of, of questions. And if you should have questions, you know, that don't really relate um, to issues covered in this talk, but you feel, you know, it's still worthwhile to, you know, to comment on um, in this format, I'm, I'm very happy to take such uh, questions as well. Oh, okay, thanks. Thanks for for uh, the possibility of posing the questions. First of all, apologies because I, I joined ten minutes after you started for technical issues, uh, but I, I appreciated your uh, intervention. I have a couple of questions related first the first part and the second part. Uh, you mentioned the European Union project. Uh, I'm quite. Uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a pro-European. I mean, I'm, I was born in Italy, but I, I've been living abroad all my life. So. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, is there really one? Is there really a EU, a EU project now? Because uh, you mentioned, you, you correctly pointed out, the European Union is, uh, I mean, is, was, was born out of uh, the goodwills wills of the state member states who wanted to, after the war, to restart, of course, their relationships, their economy, and so on. Mm -hmm. But I have the impression that at a certain point, and this crisis will uh, exacerbate this, uh, this problem, but uh, at a certain point, the European Union project stopped because European leaders do not want or do, they don't feel at ease. Well, they don't know the direction. 
whether to proceed towards a further integration or to, count, to go back to the, to the, the first uh, uh, version of, uh, of the European Union. Um, another important point, in my opinion, is uh, when you mentioned populists. Uh, yes, I mean, they are gaining momentum, even in Italy. Uh, I think uh, not only for their uh, capabilities, but actually, in my opinion, really for the lack of intervention or the lack of capability at the European level. Mm -hmm. uh, take the crisis, for example, the, this um, uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I, 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 I noticed really a, a kind of retreat of the European Union, uh, as you mentioned also, and uh, really uh, member states gaining more and more importance, gaining more and more uh, competencies in dealing with the crisis. So how do you see it? Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Eric, for, you know, for saving our question and answer uh, session. <laughs> and could I just very quickly ask you um, to say a little bit, you know, what is your background that we also you know and that the other listeners that, that we know a little bit, you know, about your background too. Yeah, uh, I studied uh, international relations uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I currently work in the uh, security department of a bank where I deal also with international security. I was uh, a police officer back 20 years ago in, uh, in Italy, a few years, uh, and now I'm, I'm living here in Vienna. But uh, my, my, my focus on many areas of interest in international relations, uh, diplomacy and so on. Yes, yeah. Thank you so much, Eric, again. And, and you know, and two, and two excellent, uh, really two really excellent questions. So, you know, is there really um, a European uh, project and has it stopped, you know, some, 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 some time ago? Um, I think that, you know, that's, that's you know, this big topic, uh, of course, but um, what you can see is that, you know, I don't think that the European project has stopped, but it, I, it has been really, really tested over, you know, over recent years. And I think that, you know, one thing that the European system never really has been very good at is to deal with very fast moving situation. So Europe is very, you know, a complex animal. It's not very centralized in terms of governance. It's multi-layered, it's multi-acted. And you need to get everybody on board and often, you know, individual units, member states are impacted by events in very different kind of ways. And, and still you need a common response. And, and I think Europe, if you look at it over time, they are not so bad, the European Union, to work out um, challenges and address, you know, policies, you know, if, if, if there's some time to build consensus and, you know, to work out these these compromises, but if they have to move very fast, um, that always creates uh, issues uh, that have a lot to do with with uh, policy making. So that's that's one dimension that I think Europe, you know, through the financial crisis uh, in 2008, and and then the debt uh, crisis, um, and 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 then of course, you know, what happens in the neighbourhood. Um, there are so many things that, that really challenge Europe, you know, over the, the past decade, and and that of course, you know, it's a real test. For Europe, I don't think you know that the project has ended. I really think it, it it has been tested. And then, of course, there's another component that maybe your questions uh, is alluding to, and, and that is you know um, Europe has started you know in 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 a certain way. Now it has started you know with the experience of of the Second World War really, and and then you know it has you know managed uh, various transitions also you know the end of the Cold War and enlargement. So. You know, when, when, when Europe, as we know it, took shape, you know, that was cut some time ago. And then you can wonder, you know, what do all these kind of founding myths and, and you know, and, and understandings and narratives that you find, you know, at the core of the European project, what do they really mean today? What do they mean to young people? Do they still believe in the European project? Uh, their experiences maybe have been, you know, much more related to um, issues like the 2008, you know, financial crisis and what happened afterward, uh, particularly, you know, in southern uh, member states that, that have really, really suffered uh, the, the consequences of this crisis very, very severely. So, so it's definitely a project, you know, that is challenged, that is tested, that you know, is to a certain extent in crisis. And again, now, you know, it, it's the Corona crisis. So, so again, we are in this, in this testing moment. Uh, has also shown, you know, some abilities to find creative solutions, but of course, you know, it's, it's tested. And, um, you know, the, the, the second question, you know, that relates, you know, to populism and the retreat, you know, to the nation state, but, but also, you know, what, what you said, you know, that it has been really member states 
managing the crisis. And, and again, you know, I think, you know, here you have to be uh, quite uh, careful not to um, reduce complexity too much. Uh, we have a multi-layered crisis, really. Uh, we have a health crisis, we have an economic crisis, we have a social crisis uh, and a governance crisis. And you need to find answers to, to all these um, different crises. And of course, um, you know, what Europe can do in addressing them differs very much, you know, according to what element of the crisis we are talking you know, about. I think, you know, Europe has quite some competences and authority to deal with the economic crisis, um, much less with the health crisis, because health is still very much, you know, an issue that is subject to, you know, member state competence. So, so um, you, you have to be, you know, uh, careful here what, what you know, what part of the crisis um, you see. But what I really agree with you is that, you know, uh, the first concern, of course, is health and safety, public safety, and, and these issues. And here the member states are in the driving seat. And in that sense, a strong signal for public perceptions. And of course, there could be, you know, also a watershed moment for finding a new balance between member states and EU institutions. So it will be, you know, interesting to see what comes out of all this. We are finding ourselves in the same position as we have been in the past quite often, as far as the European Union is concerned. When it comes to giving competences to the Union, in the past 10 years or more, uh, member states have been extremely reluctant to do so. And when it comes uh, to crisis, then everybody say, why is the European Union not doing something about it? I mean, it must be said and couldn't be stressed enough, there are no EU competences in, in the health field. So it is unfair uh, to say that the European Union hasn't acted. Okay. The European, even if, if the member states would have wanted to, couldn't have acted. Sure. It's different now uh, that uh, uh, we are talking about economic recovery. Yes. Here, clearly, the European Union has a, a very important role to play, and it does. So I find, as, as is often the case, it's also a question of communication. Yes. The member states don't want the European Union to be strong or appear to be strong. They, the governments, want to appear strong. And uh, it's, a, it's a, a battle against windmills. Don't you think so? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful to see you uh, in this format uh, again. Um, and, and I think that, you know, your question points to something that I'm increasingly um, concerned with. And, you know, on the one hand, it's very, you know, a very traditional mechanism for national governments to blame, you know, the not so, so comfortable things on the European Union and things that work best, uh, good, you now you, you take responsibility for. Uh, and, uh, of course, um, it's, you know, sometimes you feel it's a little bit like, you know, you are in a football team and, you know, some member state scores the European Union an own goal and then they complain about the performance of the European Union, now, uh, to, to this degree. But I think, you know, the most, uh, a very, very important point that you make is how do we manage communication of what the European Union does in this situation? And, you know, when I engage with um, officials at the EU level, they seem to be almost, you know, shying away from speaking out against criticism that comes from, you know, the member states. I mean, these EU institutions feel you now they represent member states, and they feel quite defenseless in some way, you now in, in communication terms, of how to deal uh, with, you know, criticism that that is not, uh, you know, even uh, factually um, correct. And and I think that Europe really uh, needs to communicate, you know, what it's what it can do, where it has competences in this crisis situation, you know, where it's up for the member states. And I think also, you know, this communication aspect needs also to think increasingly about external communication that comes into Europe. Because if you look at how China is communicating its own role uh, in, you know, this crisis, uh, and how, how this is uh, at times reflected, not only China, also Russia, in mainstream uh, European media, this is quite um, alarming. Uh, and it doesn't stop here. It really, you know, stops, uh, doesn't even stop with engaging, you know, with think tanks, with all kinds of actors 
and pressuring a certain image of what external actors do in the crisis. So I think, you know, managing communication uh, is really, it's not only what Europe does, it's not only what, you know, what, what solution it finds, but it's also, you know, how it manages public expectations about what it can do, what it cannot do, what it is doing, um, and, and, and these things. And I think that that's in crisis moment, moments where everybody looks, you know, at what is Europe doing, that's essential. Um, hello, hi. Hello. Hey, hello. Perfect. Um, hi, uh, Professor Malou. Thank you so much for the presentation. Sure. And hi, everyone. Uh, great opportunity here. Um, I am a Canadian student, currently doing my uh, PhD, second year student here at University of Vienna. Um, so I just have a question regarding Hungary. Um, it's been exactly a month since Viktor Orban declared that he's going to rule by decree. And so far, like we know the parliament and the commissions are meeting in Brussels right now. And the first time when there was a call, there was a push for invoking Article 7 was back in 2017. And over the year, 2015 actually, sorry. And over the years, there has been renewed calls. But how come it's been a month and we don't see... Um, any action taken by the EU. I understand that there is a coronavirus going on, but can this delay be interpreted as an, an incompetency or an incapability of acting against any democratic backsliding? And it's Article 17 just a show, and it won't do anything substantial or concrete. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Roy. It's an excellent question again. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's really, you know, an important case for, for, for research, uh, you know, to, 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 to study. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, that, that Europe uh, is facing uh, certain um, dilemmas and, and, and constraints here. Of course, um, you know, Article 7, if you study a little bit Article 7, um, you, you need very broad uh, support, you know, for this article to become um, uh, or develop real teeth. And, and of course, we know that, you know, that um, there's at least, you know, informal agreement among, you know, certain member states um, that, you know, that, that, that they protect um, each other from the more, you know, um, serious consequences of uh, evoking uh, this kind of action. Um, so, so that's the one element. But, but I think as, as you, you know, um, as you mentioned, you know, Europe uh, is dealing with several crises here and, and you need you know, um, also those countries who are facing Article 7 proceedings in order to work out, you know, certain compromises in, in other areas. So it's a very delicate moment to, you know, um, and, and you really need to, to pick your fights. So, so I don't think, you know, that this happens in any way under the radar of EU institutions and, and under me other member states uh, for that matter. But, but it's really, you know, at the moment, you know, um, issues will be, I guess, addressed uh, one by one, and and some issues will recede. But but I really think you know that that the issues that that you mentioned they will be with us for some time. You know, and and that these processes that they will will be worked out. Um, but but you know, um, but that but it will be will be taking some time, and it's it's not sending you know the, the nicest of signals, of course.